Well, students, in the last class, we have started discussing power method for computing dominant eigenvalue of a matrix and its corresponding eigenvector. Today, we will continue our discussion on power method. We will first recall the method and then go to prove its convergence theorem. For the power method, first and foremost, we should have a unique dominant eigenvalue of your matrix. Once you have this, then the power method might converge. However, it is not necessary that you should have this property in order to apply the power method. You can anyway go on applying the power method on any matrix that you have. Only thing is it may not converge, that's all. So let us recall the procedure for power method. You are supposed to first give an arbitrary vector, say x naught, once you have that vector, then you will generate two sequences, mu and x, where mu is a sequence of real numbers and x is a sequence of vectors given by these expressions, where yk plus 1 is defined as a into xk. Recall that you already have x naught, which you chose arbitrarily. From here, you can obtain y1 by directly multiplying the matrix A with x0. And once you have y1, then you look at the component at which the infinite norm is achieved. Take that component and define it as mu1. You have to take only the value of that component, but not the absolute value of the component while defining mu1. Often students make this mistake that they put modulus of yik plus 1 as mu k plus 1. That is not correct. You have to take the value of that component at which the infinite norm is achieved. Say, for instance, if your y1 is, say, minus 2, 1, and 0.5, then your maximum norm is achieved at the first component, and therefore mu 1 should be taken as minus 2, not just 2. Okay, so this is very important. Often students make this mistake, and then xk plus 1 is defined as yk plus 1 divided by this mu k plus 1. Okay. So since you have x0, you can generate y1. From there, you can get mu1. And once you have mu1, you can get x1. Once you have x1, you again put it here and get a y2. Once you have y2, see which component achieves the maximum norm. Take the minimum of all the components at which the maximum is achieved and take its value, not the absolute value, its value and define it as mu2. Once you have mu2, define x2, and like that, your iteration will keep on going. So in that way, you are generating two sequences. The sequence of real numbers mu k is expected to converge to the dominant eigenvalue of your matrix, and the vector sequence xk is expected to converge to an eigenvector of the dominant eigenvalue lambda. So that is the procedure for power method. Let us give an example of how to compute the, these two sequences using power method. Let us take the matrix A, just for your information, its eigenvalues are given like this. From here, you can see that the power method, if you apply to this matrix A, it will surely converge, but not given this information, we will not know whether power method is going to converge to the matrix that we have in hand or not, okay? Since it's a three by three matrix, it is very easy for us to compute this uh, eigenvalues, therefore I showed, but in practical life, we may be having a thousand cross thousand matrix or something more than that, in which case you just have to go ahead with power method blindly if you want to find the dominant eigenvalue without knowing whether it has a unique dominant eigenvalue or not. And it's also its set of eigenvectors spans the space Rn. So these two are the hypotheses of the power method. Both the hypotheses cannot be 
tested beforehand. Therefore, one has to blindly up, apply power method at this level. Again, for our information, we also have its corresponding eigenvectors given by these three vectors. Now, let us see how to compute the iterations. For that, you have to start with an initial condition x0, and that we have taken as 1.5 and 0.25. What is the first iteration for us? Well, you have to first find y1, which is nothing but a into x0. That is given by this. And in this, the maximum norm for y1 is achieved at the third component. Therefore, the value of the third component, not the modulus of it, here it doesn't matter. But if this was minus, then there is a scope for us to make a mistake. So we have to be very careful in taking the value of the component, which is in this case 7.25, and that is defined as mu1. And that is the first term of the sequence that we hope to converge to the dominant eigenvalue, the dominant eigenvalue in our case is three. Therefore, the first term of our sequence is 7.25, which is reasonably far from what we want. But nevertheless, we hope that as we go on to higher and higher iterations, this mu will tend to go closer and closer to the dominant eigenvalue. Let us see that. Before that, let us also see how x1 is coming. x1 is nothing but y1, that is this vector, divided by mu1. And that is given by this vector. Therefore, we have computed iteration 1. And we see that we are no way near to what we want in both the sequences. Let us go to the next iteration and see how that comes out. Well, I have just recalled uh, our eigenvalues and eigenvectors of our matrix just for our convenience. Y2 is computed by A into X1, and that is given by this vector. Again, the maximum norm is achieved at the third component. And that is taken as mu2. The value of it is taken as mu2. And once you have mu2, x2 is obtained as y2 divided by mu2. You can see that the second term of our sequence of real numbers is pretty close to what we want, which is lambda 1 equal to 3. We have mu2 is equal to 2.65. When compared to the first term, this is pretty close to lambda 1. Let us see what is happening with the sequence x. x2 is given by this. We expect it to converge to v1 or a scalar multiple of v1. That is what we want. Here you can see that the third component is 1 and here the third component is 2. Therefore, most likely we are converging to 1 by 2 times v1, right? Then at least the third component will coincide. And you can see that anyway, second component is 0. And the first component is also respecting this idea. Therefore, most probably we are converging to 1 by 2 v1. If that is so, then we are pretty close to what we want as eigenvector for lambda 1. Let us go to the iteration 3 and see what is happening. Y3 is obtained as A into X3. That is this one. And that is given by this vector. Again, the third component is coming as the maximum norm. Therefore, we take its value as mu3 and obtain X3 as Y3 divided by mu3. You can see that when compared to mu2, mu3 is more closer to lambda 1 and x3 when compared to x2 is more closer to 1 by 2 times v1, right? Therefore, we are into the track of converging to the dominant eigenvalue and an eigenvector of the dominant eigenvalue. Let's go to the higher iterations. mu4 is given like this. 
you just keep an eye on this quantity and this quantity. Remember, this should be 1 by 2, 0, and 1. This is what we want as the corresponding eigenvector for lambda 1 equal to 3. And this should go to 3. And mu 5 is given by this. It's pretty close to 3. And this is also pretty close to 1 by 2, 0, and 1. And 6 is given by this. 7 is given by this. You can see that it's going very nicely to lambda 1. And x is going very nicely to 1 by 2, v1. Then 8, 9, 10 is given like this. Well, I have stopped my iteration up to here. One can go on doing this. And at the 10th iteration, you can see that up to at least four digits, after the decimal place, we are uh, very much accurate to lambda 1. And here also, you can see that you are very close to 1 by 2, 0, 1, right? So in this way, we hope that the power method is nicely converging to the dominant eigenvalue and a corresponding eigenvector to the dominant eigenvalue. So this is a successful story of power method. Let us now give another example where power method doesn't work. Let us take the ma matrix B, which we have already shown in one of the previous slides. The matrix B has the following eigenvalues, 1, minus 2, and 2. You can clearly see that 2 and minus 2 are the dominant eigenvalues. And therefore, V doesn't have a unique dominant eigenvalue. We will see that in this case, power method will not converge. Let us compute the iterations explicitly and see this. We start the initial guess with x0 equal to 1, 1, 1. And the first iteration gives us these values. You have y1 equal to a into x0, which is given like this. And the maximum norm for y1 is achieved at the first component. Therefore, we have taken mu1 equal to 8. And then x1 equal to y1 by mu1. One more important thing you would have noticed in the last example also, that the maximum norm of xk will always be 1, right? Why it is so? Because we are always normalizing y vector, and that is what we are calling as the x vector, right? Therefore, x is always a unit vector with respect to the infinite norm. The second iteration is given by this. You just keep observing mu2. At least we know where it should converge. It should converge either to minus 2 or to the value 2. Let us see what is happening. In the iteration 3, we got mu3 like this. Iteration 4, we got mu like this. And like that, we keep on going for several iterations. And at 997th iteration, well, I have done it on a computer. We cannot manually do it. The value of mu is given by this. And at the 998th iteration, mu value is like this. Just remember these two values. Let me go to the next two iterations. 999th iteration is same as the 997th iteration. And the 1000th iteration is the same as the 998th iteration. And therefore, you can see that this values will keep on repeating in the further iterations also. That shows that the sequences in power method are simply oscillating between these two values. And therefore, we don't expect the entire sequences to converge, whether it is mu or x. Now, this gives us a curiosity of what are all the hypotheses under which the power method will surely converge? That is, we want to get some sufficient conditions for the convergence of power method. 
This is what we will be doing in the next theorem. Let us assume that the matrix A is non-singular n by n matrix, which has real eigenvalues. The first hypothesis that we need to impose as a sufficient condition is that A has a unique dominant eigenvalue. This we have already mentioned. And we have also seen two examples. So therefore, this condition is well illustrated for us. And the next hypothesis is also already mentioned. A has n linearly independent eigenvectors. That is, eigenvectors should span R n. That is what this hypothesis means. Why we need this hypothesis? Because this will allow us to represent x naught as the linear combination of the eigenvectors, right? From there only we recursively apply A and every time we remove lambda one outside and that is how we generated the sequences, right? Therefore, this is very important. And the last hypothesis, which I have probably not mentioned is that whatever initial guess that you choose, well, of course you can represent it like this because VIs are spanning Rn, but then the hypothesis says that you should choose your X naught in such a way that C1, that is the first term of this representation, that scalar should not be equal to zero. Of course, X naught should not belong to the kernel of AK for any K that we take, but then what happens if you choose your x naught in such a way that c1 is equal to 0. Then if you remember, we are applying a recursively to x naught and every time we are removing lambda k outside and what remains is c1, v1 plus the other terms, right? The other terms goes to 0 as k tends to infinity thanks to this uh, dominant eigenvalue condition. Therefore, what remains finally will be C1 into V1. If C1 happens to be zero, then there is a problem, right? So that should not happen. That is why your C1 should not be equal to zero. One has to choose your X naught like that. This is a main drawback. In fact, all these are drawbacks for the power method because when you go to use power method for any matrix, you are actually expected not to know any of this information, right? Therefore, uh, applying power method in this sense is just a blind work, but nevertheless, for convergence theorem, these are the sufficient conditions. Theoretically, we can see this. Well, under these hypothesis, what happens? That is the conclusion is finally that if all this hypothesis holds for a matrix A, then surely you can say that the sequence mu k converges to the dominant eigenvalue lambda one. And what about the sequence xk? Well, this sequence may or may not converge to an eigenvector of lambda one, but surely you can find a subsequence that converges to an eigenvector of lambda one. That is what the theorem says. Your full sequence may not converge, but surely this you can find a subsequence that converges. So this is the convergence theorem for power method. Let us prove this theorem. Let us first prove this second statement and then go to prove the first statement. Well, let us start with the way xk plus one is defined. xk plus one is a xk divided by mu k, right? Well, what is xk? xk is nothing but yk divided by mu k, right? Therefore, you have a into yk divided by mu k plus one into mu k. So that is what I'm writing here. Now, again, what is yk? yk is nothing but a times xk minus, right? So it is a Square xk minus 1 divided by mu k plus 1 into mu k. Now you can keep on continuing this idea 
and you can see that that is recursively you put again x k minus one is nothing but y k divided by this will be y k minus one divided by mu k minus one already one mu k is there and mu k plus one is there and that can be written as a cube x k minus one right mu k plus one mu k into mu k minus one like that it will keep on going every time you apply this you will gain one power here and one term will come here right like that you keep on going when you reach x naught you will be gaining k plus one power for a and in the denominator you will keep on including one term in the product and that will finally give you the product of the mu's up to mu k plus one. Now, this implies that x k plus one can be written as a k plus one x naught, that is what I'm writing here, right? And what remains is one by mu k plus one up to mu one, that I'm using a separate notation m k plus one, and that I am writing here. Therefore, x k plus one equal to m k plus one, a k plus one into x naught. This is what we got. Now we'll see, we know what is x naught, right? x naught is nothing but sigma i equal to one to n c i v i, right? Where v i is are the Eigen vectors corresponding to the Eigen values lambda i's. And that is what is x naught. So I will substitute this expression here and I will get this expression. Where if you remember, I had a a k plus one. So I am just multiplying that a k plus one on these expressions and thereby I'm getting this. Every time when I'm multiplying, I'm getting a lambda. Out of all these lambdas, lambda one I'm pulling outside and that will make lambda one to sit in the denominator in the other terms other than first term, right? This idea we have already done in a different way when we are deriving the power method sequences, the same idea I'm doing here. Now you take norm on both sides, norm on both sides, that is infinite norm. And you can see that since norm of X is one, you should go back and see why norm of X is always one. I have just now explained because xk's are normalized y vectors, right? Therefore, the infinite norm becomes one. They are normalized in terms of the infinite norm, that is L infinity norm. And therefore, the left-hand side becomes one. The right-hand side is, well, this is a scalar that therefore it comes out as modulus. And what remains the vector is just taken with the infinite norm now. Now you take k tending to infinity. What happens? This term will go to zero, right? Why? Because of the assumption that lambda one is the dominant eigenvalue. Therefore, all these numbers are less than one and hence their power k makes this entire term to go to zero as k tends to infinity. Now what remains therefore is m k plus one lambda k plus one into norm c v one. In that also you can remove c one outside and make it modulus of c one and this entire thing you take to the other side. That is what I got here. Now you can also see that why we have assumed c one not equal to zero, right? that is sitting in the denominator here. Well, we got this, now what to do with this? Let us see, if you go back and see this, you will see that xk plus one 
limit n k tends to infinity will therefore be converging to this that is m k plus 1 lambda 1 k plus 1 c 1 b 1 right in that this term is going to be given like this so i will substitute that here but that has a modulus therefore it can this can be either plus 1 by mod c1 v1 or minus of that right so that is what we are writing limit k tends to infinity x k plus 1 will be limit k tends to infinity m k plus 1 lambda 1 k plus 1 into c1 into v1 but this is going to be either plus 1 by mod c1 norm v1 infinite norm or minus of that okay therefore this entire sequence will either converge to plus v1 v1 is here already c gets cancelled with the denominator divided by norm v1 is here that is what we are putting so this entire sequence either converges to plus this value or minus this value or it may oscillate between these two right it may also oscillate that is also one possibility why should it converge we have never told that it will converge right it may also oscillate between these two. in which case we can say that there exists a subsequence you can always extract those terms which leads to one of these values and that subsequence will converge to that value right there exists a subsequence that converges to plus v1 by norm v1 or there exists another subsequence that converges to minus v1 divided by norm v1 so if the sequence oscillates between these two values then we can say that there exists in fact and we can say and there exists another subsequence that converge okay so this is what the conclusion of two which says that your sequence well it may not converge but there exists a subsequence that converges right if this happens then the entire sequence itself can be taken as a subsequence or if this happens again the entire sequence can be taken as a subsequence whereas if this happens then you precisely filter those terms which are eventually taking you to this term and that will be one subsequence and filter those terms which are taking to this value that will be another subsequence therefore your conclusion 2 is proved. Here you should importantly see that your sequence xk is actually converging to an eigenvector of lambda 1. Well, what is that eigenvector? Well, it is v1 divided by norm v1 infinity, either this or minus. So it converges to these values. Okay one of these values either as a full sequence or as a subsequence you have to keep this in mind well now let us prove conclusion one what is conclusion one the conclusion one says that the sequence mu k converges to lambda one how to prove this let us see we start with y k plus one by definition it is a into x k now take the limit on both sides as k tends to infinity we have this and that can be written as why because we know that now xk is going to converge to v1 by norm v1 right either it is plus or minus Therefore, when I apply A to it, that will converge to lambda 1 times V1 and this scalar will be kept as it is. I will call that as K. Okay, K is plus or minus 1 divided by V1 norm, that is infinite norm. And A into V1 will become lambda 1 into V1. Well, this can happen up to a subsequence right as we saw 
the conclusion two doesn't say that the entire sequence will always converge. It can only give us a guarantee up to a subsequence converge. Therefore, this happens up to subsequence that we have to keep in mind. Now, you look at the right hand side, it is actually a non zero vector. Why? Because V1 is a non zero vector, right? V1 is a non zero vector by definition of eigenvectors. Therefore, there is at least one component of yk plus 1 which converges to a non zero number. Right, because this is non zero, therefore this limit should be non zero. Hence, at least there is one component of yk plus one which is converging to that non zero component. Let us call that non zero component as the jth component and let us fix that component and see what happens. Since this jth component of y is converging to a non-zero number, you can always find a integer large enough such that yj of k plus one is not equal to zero for all k greater than or equal to n, right? Because it is converging to a non-zero number, therefore after a large number of terms, it will surely be sticking very close to that non-zero number and therefore all these terms of the sequence yj will be non-zero. This I hope you can see it with your experience of convergence of sequences of real numbers. Similarly, you can also conclude that that component of xj will also be non-zero, right? Because yj, if it is non-zero, xj is just a normalized y vector normalized with respect to the infinite norm. Therefore, if yj is non-zero, then xj will also be non-zero. Now, go back to the definition of the vector x is nothing but y divided by mu. Therefore, I am writing mu into x as y. That gives us mu is equal to, now what I am doing is, I am just picking up one component of both these vectors. That's what I am doing. That component for which you have seen that both yj and xj are non-zero for large enough k, right? So that component j alone I'm picking up from x and y, and then I can push this to this side. See why I'm doing it? Because I cannot divide by the vector. That is why I'm just picking up one component and then dividing. Okay, so that way mu k can be written like this. And that is nothing but by the definition of y, it is a times xk. And x, x I'm keeping as it is and taking the jth component. Just writing this like this, right? And then that jth component we are taking, yeah, where j is such that it uh, comes like this. You have chosen it like this, you just choose any one component of y and the corresponding component of x for which they are non-zero. Surely such a component will exist. That's what we have seen. The idea is coming from here because at the limit, y is actually converging to this vector and this vector is a non-zero vector. Therefore, at least one component will be non-zero. From there only, we are picking up this j. Among those non-zero components, you can choose anything. That is not a problem. Now you take limit on both sides, k tending to infinity. On both sides, you take the limit. You get limit k tends to infinity mu k equal to, I'm just writing a into xk. a into xk is given like this. k lambda 1 bar into v1, right? So that's what I'm k into this lambda times v1, right? That's what in the next step I'm writing. Similarly, in the denominator, you have the same x we have already seen. x k plus 1 is actually converging at least up to a subsequence plus or minus 1 by norm v1, right? That is our k. If you recall, that is our k times v1. And that is what I have put here because in the denominator, we had one of the components of xk plus one. That I 
just substituted by this. Whereas in the numerator, we are taking y k plus 1, its jth component, right? And that is nothing but a x k and its jth component. And x k is given like this. That is how this term is coming. And now k k goes off and one component of b 1 and the same component of b 1, even this gets cancelled and you have lambda 1 finally as the limit of this sequence. So this is how we see that the sequence mu is converging to lambda 1. By the way, the method defines mu k. It is not very clear why that mu k has to converge to lambda 1. But by going through this proof, it is very clear that yes, this sequence mu k is converging to lambda 1, provided those hypotheses, three hypotheses that we gave are satisfied by the matrix A. And this completes the proof of our theorem on the convergence of power methods.